Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Design for Health. I'm Dr. Kyra Bobinet, and I co-teach with Dr. Larry Chu, Executive Director of Stanford Medicine X and an Associate Professor of Anesthesia here at Stanford School of Medicine. And uh, this week, we're really privileged to have Dr. D I mean, Dr. David No. I just promoted him. Um, uh, Stanford's first behavior design major in 2013 under B.J. Fogg. Uh, for the last 10 months, he's been consulting and traveling to grow himself professionally and spiritually. Here is his story of using behavior design for mindfulness and well-being, and we'll hear from David right after this message. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there's a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Christopher Snyder is the in-class moderator for today's program and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion this evening. We also wish to remind you that registration for Medicine X is now open. Don't miss the year's premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Unique opportunities such as our masterclass program and our IDEO design challenge workshop have extremely limited space availability. You'll want to make sure to take advantage of these programs while our regular registration rates are still available until August 1st, 2014. So please make sure to register today. Please also make sure to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note you are watching a live online program and there's a delay between real time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in class guests will appear before you see the real time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. Hi everyone, my name is David Noah and I'm so grateful that I'm here and I'm able to ignite Jennifer Krakowski's talk with an own personal story of mine, how I use behavior design to design my own well-being and mindfulness. So I only have five minutes, so I'm going to share the most pivotal components of uh, my story uh, that helped me maintain my mindfulness um, and well-being uh, in, in the past 10 months since I've been traveling. So the story starts with... Uh, growing up and especially at Stanford. So two aspects, delayed gratification and uh, uh, work. Uh, so working all the time and delayed gratification. Many of us, that's how we got here to Stanford. And then how, and throughout the years, um, we continued to still achieve like what we wanted, to delay gratification and continue working. Uh, so for me, I realized um, I was a workaholic. <laughs> I could just like work all the time. And then I would delay gratification. Uh, but in the past 10 months, here's what I realized. So I want to share a couple things. What uh, gave me the balance how, and how I did it. So in August, I went through a breakup, which shook me and woke me up. And it launched me in this whole soul searching and traveling phase. And this isn't a rare story. Breakups usually wake us up. It may take other forms, such as uh, you get fired from your job, or you go through another transition phase. In those phases, in those uh, phases, it wakes you up. And uh, here's what I learned. So, hmm, what should I share? I only have five minutes. Yeah, the f one of the first things that I did throughout college was uh, just uh, work. I felt productive. However, here's one thing that I did to combat that now. I set boundaries. I tell clients, hey, I don't work on the weekends. I don't work after dinner. And it's to give you the most optimal value that I can give you. Uh, because if I'm balanced, then that means I can provide you more value. Uh, the second thing with delayed gratification, here's what I also learned, is that whenever, we, whenever I did something uh, well, I would... I numbed myself so much that I didn't really feel the, the joy that should come with after you do something really well. And that came with awareness. And awareness came with meditating. 
that can come in many forms. Walking, you can sit and meditate, you can mindfully eat, but meditating gives you more awareness, um, which really helped me. Uh, so here, how much time do I have left? <laughs> Two minutes? Okay, great. So here's what I want to leave you with. I found three behaviors that really changed my life, and these are three behaviors that you can immediately do when you wake up uh, so that you have a decreased stress and increased focus. So I've never shared this before publicly, so here you guys go. First behavior is when you wake up, don't check your email. How, uh, I just want to raise a hands. How many people check their email now is the first thing we go, oh my god, what about text messages? Okay, for those, can uh, the people online see the hands that were raised? Okay, all right. So behavior, no, so don't do that, and immediately you will decrease your stress. Because immediately when you see your emails, it's just a flood of, oh my god, like these are all the things I have to do. Behavior number two is if you are aware when you wake up and you feel stressed and rushed already, like don't feel that way. If you're aware of it, just by telling yourself, okay, slow down, not rushing, that'll make a huge difference. And then behavior number three is the first thing that you do and that I've been doing, and if I don't do this, then my day goes off. But if you do do this, you already won as the first thing that you do, which is take the time to really feel happy and feel grateful. That, that's something that you do. It's not a feeling. It's something that you do. And if you do that as the first thing, you already won throughout your entire day. So with that, okay, I would like to introduce Jennifer Kurkowski, and this is her bio. Jennifer Kurkowski directs Google's People and Innovation Lab that conducts research aimed at improving the company's organizational practices. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Slate, as well as on the BBC and ABC's Nightline. Previously, Jennifer led community management for Excite at Home and consulted with nonprofit organizations on leadership development. Jennifer holds a PhD in business administration, organizational behavior from UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business, and this was my own alarm, to stop at five minutes, perfect timing, and after this message, Jennifer Krakowski will give her talk on Inside the Kitchen from Google. So thank you. Time to take another shout out to Twitter. If you are following this conversation online or on Twitter, Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is moderating the Twitter discussion on the MedX hashtag. If you are just joining us, we have with us today Jennifer Krakowski, People Analytics Manager at Google, speaking with us today on the topic of designing for health in the workplace. E-patients and caregivers out there, what questions do you have for our speaker today? What products designed for health are working for patients now and how can they be further improved? How might we design our workplace to encourage healthy behaviors? Healthcare providers, technologists, and researchers out there, how do you see designing our workplace environments to encourage healthy behaviors? Tweet us your questions or responses, and we'll do our best to have them addressed during this class in our Stanford University School of Medicine course, Design for Health, for Thursday, May 8th, 2014. Hi folks, um, I'm Jennifer Kirkowski. It's quite a pleasure to be here today. Uh, don't get the opportunity to talk with students um, as much anymore, and I find it particularly energizing. You all bring some of the best questions because you see material for the first time, and it's new, and you're in the midst of this. So I'll start by saying, please bring your questions on. I know we kind of try to do that at the end, but I'm open to questions in the middle of things as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways that we're bringing behavior design principles to bear on health-related issues at, at Google. I'm going to speak specifically about the food. Uh, which is near and dear to the hearts of many at Google for reasons that will become clear when I show the photos in a moment. Uh, so Google strives to, be a not, to not be a conventional company. It, it's from the beginning principles. And that plays out in some of the audacious questions that we're encouraged to ask. So things like, you know, what if you could explore a coral reef from your desktop? Street View works underwater. Um, I had somebody once ask me if it was real time. I said, no, it's not real time, N not yet. Um, you know, or, or what if um, the great art of the world were available to anyone, anywhere? You'd have to travel to see it. 
you can tour the Louvre with your desktop or um, uh, collections of Islamic art, things that aren't available. Um, what if you could wear the internet? So this is the point at the talk where I usually have to really disappoint people because I'm not going to talk about any of these things because I'm from HR. <laughs> um, David alluded to the work that I do. I, I run the People Innovation Lab, which is an applied R&D lab in HR. And I usually say that sentence again because these are words that don't typically go together. Applied research and development and HR. Uh, yes. It, <laughs> For those who've been in the work world, it does, it does elicit a chuckle. It's not something one typically hears. But at Google, the idea is that innovation isn't something limited to the product side of the world. You can innovate in how the organization is structured, how we function. Um, people spend an inordinate amount of their lives, so of their waking hours in an organization. How can we make that experience awesome? Work shouldn't suck. Not how much, given how much time we spend there. How can we help with that? So, to give a little context, uh, there, are about, there are over 46,000 employees now in 70 offices plus in over 40 countries. It's a lot of people. It's a diverse lot. Um, but what brings people together uh, is food. And to that end, we've asked an audacious question ourselves. Um, what if working at Google added two years to your life? Just by virtue of working at that particular company, how, how might we get there? So those are the kinds of questions that prompt us to think about, well, what can we do about that? All right. So Googlers love choice um, in the food and in everything. Just for those who have heard a lot about the perks at Google, um, yes, there are three meals a day. Yes, it's amazing. And yes, it's free. Uh, these are just some pictures of it. We have um, you know, a focus on not just providing food, but providing an environment that supports creativity, collaboration, innovation, and casual collisions. The idea that you might run into somebody you might not otherwise talk with. Uh, there are 150 plus cafes globally serving 60,000 meals a day. Um, this is our Toronto office, um, our Tel Aviv office. We have all these micro kitchens. Uh, so how can we help people be healthy for the long haul? All right. We're here right now in the Silicon Valley, one of the most competitive talent markets. We can't afford to have people burn out or not take care of themselves. So aside from it kind of being the right thing to do to help people be healthy, as a company we also think about, well, how do we retain people and help them feel good and healthy so that they can be productive and they can be productive for years um, and pursue some of these audacious questions. All right. Um, so. This is an example of one meal, one day, in one cafe. So you start to get a sense of how many decisions there are to make. Um, it's a lot. And the way we've chosen to sort of apply science that, we looked at nudges. And part of the point I want to make here is that we're not looking to recreate science. There's a lot of amazing work that's already done uh, by a number of scholars and other researchers around the world. So, we're trying to build on what's already known. Um, the presence of so much choice presents the opportunity to help guide people in the choices that they make. And I say guide very specifically. It's not dictate. Um, one of the key tenets for us is not to restrict choice, but to help people make the choices they've already told us that they want to make. We hear consistently from our employees that they want to be healthier. They want to raise their well-being. They want work-life balance. So how do we help them make the choices that lead them in the direction they've already told us they want to go? Right. Um, so nudges take as their starting point kind of our understanding of how the brain functions. Uh, cognitively, um, motivationally, effectively, the processes that are at work in our minds. So when behavioral economics really started to get a lot of attention, I think maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it came as a shock to no one but the economists that people are not rational creatures. So they're not irrational. Um, we are somewhat non-rational, but we're non-rational in predictable ways. We don't always do the thing that's best for us. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those specific ways. Um, and these all provide opportunities for influence. You know, looking at the different kinds of channels that we have to help people make these kinds of choices, whether that's to not check your email in the morning 
or to get more exercise or to eat your fruits and vegetables. There are ways that we can design the environment to nudge people in this direction. Um, another way to talk about, I'll throw in some more of the science for this audience, which is asymmetric paternalism, which is a way of saying that we want people to make, uh, guide people towards the choices they say they want, but not disadvantage people who are already behaving in that way. Um, this comes out of work by Cass and, uh, um, Thaler and Sunstein out of University of Chicago. Uh, and these are three examples of particular biases that, and uh, cognitive processes that we've applied in some of the exper experiments that we've done at, at Google. My favorite is sort of present-based um, preferences, which is kind of like saying, screw you, future self. I'm going to do what I want now. Like, I'm going to watch one more episode of Marvel's um, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. instead of going to bed even though I know I'm going to have to get up at 6 a.m. when my infant cries. So for example, pulled out of the air. Uh, so here's, here's one of the studies that we did. Um, so getting back to food, you know, decision making is costly, right? It requires us to make a choice. Uh, and there are instances in which we want people to engage actively and make that choice. And other times you want the choice to be easy. So how can we set the defaults of the environment in such a way that when you encounter a decision, if it's one that should be hard, you should have to think hard about whether or not you eat that piece of cake, but it should be really easy for you to grab the banana. Right? So how do we structure the environment to make decisions easy where they should be and hard where we want you or you want you to exercise effort. Okay. So this one um, looks at plate size and is built on a research done by Brian Wansink and others at Cornell and with the idea that if the container's big enough, you're going to take more food. Fairly well established. So what we want to find out is if we tell people about that, that does that help guide behaviors? So this is an example of the status quo bias that you're just going to kind of continue doing what you typically do. You stick with the defaults and also the unit bias related to food. You, you eat a bag of chips, whether that's two servings in that bag of chips, one serving or 10 servings in that bag of chips. People tend to eat the whole bag. Uh, so we put out two plates. We had big plates and we had smaller plates and we counted for a week. Actually counted how many plates got used and, and surveyed people in the cafe. And then we put up little signs. Um, Big plate or small plate, it's your choice. So again, coming back to this idea, we don't want to take choice away, but help people, help guide people, and told people about the research. You know, hey, you know, if you get a bigger plate, you're more likely to eat more food. Pick your plate. Uh, so we, in fact, found that people changed their behavior, right? So there was an increase in the choice of small plates. Most people told us one plate was enough, and we heard that uh, people actually felt it was helpful for them. So it's not the ideal, scientifically speaking, it's not a perfect experiment. Ideally, we would have been able to measure the actual food eaten. There are a number of other things, uh, but it, it, there are complications for field research. Um, I will also say that, that at Google, doing the research isn't enough. We're not done yet. It then becomes part of what we do. So now there are small plates available in, in many of the cafes. They're just there, right? And we have the signs that are just there. The study's done. We found. Uh, some interesting suggestive findings and it becomes policy. It, it's part of what makes the job that I get to do really exciting, especially as somebody who comes from an academic background, that we do, we do experiments, we create data, we get some insight and people said that makes sense, let's do something differently as a result. And then being held accountable for shaping company policy. Uh, so making sure that things happen as a result of my research, which is kind of fun. Okay. So, the, the, micro, the cafes are not the only place that people eat at Google. Um, I alluded to the micro kitchens that we have, which are really anything but micro. These things are stocked with all kinds of wonderful, tempting snacks. Um, in the New York office, where I worked for a couple of years, this is how we used to stock the M&Ms. The gravity bins, for anyone who's been to the bulk food aisle of Trader, you know, wherever, Whole Foods, what have you, I'm, I'm sure you've never had the experience of buying a few more lentils than you intended, <laughs> right? Okay, so imagine that's M&Ms. You're not gonna put them back. Oh, I got a few more M&Ms, oh, okay, fine, right? So you've got a couple problems here. One, these things are equally weighted and there's no real way to control 
how much you get, not effectively. So um, we, we changed it. Again, here, we, didn't, we, we didn't change the availability. We just moved them. So we took the M&Ms, put them in an opaque uh, white ceramic container with a scoop, with a label, M&Ms, put them on the lower shelves, put the dried fruit and the nuts and the healthier stuff and the fresh fruit very nicely displayed in a well-lit cabinet. Um, and in the seven weeks following that change of moving the M&Ms out of the gravity bins, we saw 3.1 million calories fewer consumed from M&Ms. No one felt deprived. We just made it a little bit harder. We made it such that you had to think, I'm hungry. Do I want some M&Ms? Or I'm hungry. Oh, look, there's a banana. So again, when decisions, when setting the defaults, when you want to think hard about it, make yourself think hard. When you want it to be easy, make it easy. So this is a, in this case, we were manipulating visceral factors. Right? It's right there. You have this reaction to it. Um, it. It's something you can do at home, too. That you, know, you don't have to be Google to do these kinds of things. You can hide the M&Ms in your house. You don't have to leave the cake out on the counter. You don't have to leave the cookies open sitting on the counter. You can bury them back. Uh, I find this now with my toddler. I have a, I have a two-year-old and, uh, and an infant, and uh, I've found it's really important to make sure that the iPad is not visible and that he does not know where I keep my personal chocolate stash. <laughs> it's just going to be easier that way. All right. um, so we did this same experiment or similar experiment in, in, our, in one of our other offices and, and found a very similar effect um, <laughs> with a decrease in consumption of candy. It also illustrates some of the other difficulties of doing field research. That particular period of time, it was in Boulder, there were a bunch of wildfires in Colorado, and we ended up opening our offices there to support the volunteer firefighter effort, so it completely skewed the counts that we had for how we were stocking our micro kitchens. Um, and we got the data back, and we were completely baffled by what was going on until we found out that wildfires in Colorado had affected our experiment in a micro kitchen in our Boulder office. So. Research can be fun and exciting. All right. So um, coming back to that question that I posed at the beginning, what if, what if working for Google added two years to your life? There, there are kind of three thoughts I want to leave you with. Um, one is that when you think about the small decisions that we make every day, right, whether that's what you eat, whether to exercise, to check your email, how, uh, investing in retirement, any of these things, those decisions could make all the difference at the right time. Right? And they're small. And they can be shaped. And we can design the environments to help people make decisions in a different way. Um, the second is that the context for many of these decisions is the workplace. Right? We spend, or will spend, uh, many much of our life, many of our waking hours in a work environment. And as I said, it, you don't have to be Google to do these things. Many of these changes are small. And so I really do believe there's enormous opportunity for many workplaces, um, university settings, to shift some of the design of their environments, whether that's making um, stairwells more inviting. There's research that shows that if stairwells are well, well lit, with interesting paint um, and pictures, people will use them more than if they're off in the corner. In fact, at the last time I was here at Stanford Hospital, uh, I was in labor. And you go in the Lucille Packard children, the entrance to Packard, and it says, on the elevators, why not take the stairs? You cannot find the stairs. There is no sign saying here, that I happily take the stairs. So one simple, stairs are this way would probably substantially increase likely. I probably wouldn't have taken the stairs in that moment, <laughs> let's be clear. Um, but again, I would challenge all of you to think about what are the small changes to the environment that help guide people towards the behaviors that they have said they want to take. Uh, and then finally, um, much of the research around nudging is one time. It's pick this plate, um, you know, don't eat this. 
what happens when people figure out where the M&Ms are, right? You, when you know where you put the bag of cookies, how does this play out over time? How do we create uh, nudges when we know that as cognitive creatures we become habituated and we develop patterns? So I think that's, that for me is one of the unknown frontiers of research that how do we take nudging over the long term, right, and help people form uh, and maintain those behaviors. Uh, this work is, is still somewhat new for us. Um, and we're continuing to learn. And again, I'm excited to hear the questions that folks here have and the ideas that I might be able to take back with me. Thank you very much. First question. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I get that the, the scope of, of this research is the workplace, but I'm just curious um, if you guys have done any research into uh, if these behaviors or nudges are having effects in their home, in employees' home life and how? I would love to know the answer to that question, um, and we have not. But perhaps, you know, I'd like to think that they, that they do. Um, and we could probably do a better job of helping people explicitly take some of the lessons home. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, but there's a research project they're waiting to happen if you have any interest. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Next question. Yes, gentleman in the front. Stand thank up. you. Um, so where do you guys find some of the research? Like you mentioned, uh, Cass and Sunstein, you mentioned mm -hmm. Nudge. Um, I'm sure habits, a lot of the psychology, behavioral psychology. But where do you guys kind of find these ideas that you test out in your kitchens? Sure. Um, and so I have the great honor of working with a team of fellow, sort of I call us academic refugees. We, we left traditional academia, but many of us come uh, from academic backgrounds. So. My training is in management and organizations. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, who actually did much of this research uh, studied decision science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, uh, industrial organizational psychology, sociology, so people who, who have who come steeped in the literature. And we make an effort to stay up to date and come and, and talk with other people who are currently studying issues. Go to academic conferences, read journals uh, to keep abreast of current research, and to think how can we extend the work? Uh, in some cases, it makes sense to try to test and say, oh, does this apply to our population? And while it, everybody wants to think they're special, and perhaps Google is a little special, at the end of the day, it's a 40,000-person company. There are lots of 40,000-person companies. It's not that special. And so I think it's reasonable to think that some things that work with people might work with people at Google. So the challenge then becomes to find out, well, what are the unanswered questions and how might we contribute to the literature as well as learn from it? So as people who are trained in science, we're always looking to do both. How can we take what's already known, apply and extend, and then ideally share back what we have learned? So I know like in technology, the default setting oftentimes makes a lot of difference in terms of your mental health and the usability of whatever you're trying to operate. Um, do you ever do any collaborations with like programmers or people, people that are not necessarily in HR in order to make better user interfaces for just things around the company? We are starting to um, because you're absolutely right. And we do often work with uh, folks throughout the company. Um, I was talking once with somebody about some of this research and he used the word, uh, the phrase rats in a maze to describe what we were doing with employees and not the term I would use. I prefer to think of our employees as my research partners, right? These are, these are the people down the hall from me. Uh, and so I think of them as collaborators in, in the research, which means they often have as valu incredibly valuable ideas to suggest alternate ways of interpreting the results, suggestions for additional studies. And that has, not surprisingly, involve, evolved into partnerships on um, uh, relative, related to well-being, particularly looking at, you know, 
how, how do you make this device useful and not run your life? So for example, I actually have turned off notifications on my phone, um, except for text messages, because I do have small children, uh, and meetings, because otherwise I'd forget to go. But it does not tell me when I have email. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. I want to be the one to decide when I check it. And so what, you know, what if, what if you've, you could set your phone to lock uh, after you checked it <coughs> 10 times in the last hour, right? Not a very high bar. <laughs> But what if it told me, it's like, you've already checked your phone 10 times this hour. Are you sure you want to do this again? Oh, maybe, right, maybe not. So it, it's interesting to think about what, what would that look like? What are ways we can develop technology to, again, to help us focus our attention instead of letting it be fragmented? I don't have good answers. It's, it's not an area I, I know personally, but I think it's one of, I think it's a crucial question to be asking right now. Jennifer, there's a question on, from Twitter uh, from Chris. What is the best way to approach HR about trying some of the changes shared? And how do we start this conversation respectfully? Uh, so approaching HR in another company. I'm, um, so, so if it's HR at Google, you can email me. But um, for other companies, it, one of the things I really appreciate about where I get to work is that it, these are folks who understand data. So when we send out a survey that says, you've been selected as part of a stratified random sample to participate in the study, people will say, oh, stratified on what? <laughs> they get research. Um, and so when we can show data, people go, oh, OK, that makes, wait, how did you sample? Um, it, we, what was that regression you ran? So it, it means that um, when, what I would tell people is bring data to HR and show. But I know that story doesn't work with old companies. So I think in that case, it's look at what's important to HR at any given company. What do they value? What are they worried about? And how can what you suggest to try address something that they want to change and that they're worried about? So learn to, sp and this, is, this applies in, in many fields. You know, figure out what the other person is concerned about and come up with a solution. Of questions. One is about um, food is often tied to religious practices. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? And the second thing you sort of alluded to in your comments about the fires in Colorado, which is you have an interruption in your daily, you know, plans. Uh, you know, what if it turns out that kale really is bad for you? How do you get? How fast do you get it out of the kitchen? Mm. And what do you do in those situations? So the first. Uh so tied to religious practice. So food, food is so much more than, than physical nourishment. And so I think it's critical to acknowledge that. We have a lot of um, Googler organized events related to food. So there will be seders at Passover. There will be uh, the um, Diwali. They'll do a festival. They'll, so there's a very conscious effort to recognize the role of food in culture and ceremony and a religious practice. Um, when it's Ramadan, they will often have food available later at night for people who've been fasting. So it, it's a global company, as it's a very diverse set of people come to work there. Uh, and as a, as a scholar of organizations, I think there's something profound about providing people with food, providing a meal, and creating the conversation that happens around mealtime that is something well beyond uh, giving people calories. Mm -hmm. And I think it sets an interesting dynamic in the culture of the company. That I, I'm not sure how much other people think about it, but it's quite clear to me as, a, as an organization scholar. As to the, what do you do when you find out something's bad? <sighs> My sense is in nutrition research, that's a really tough one. It does seem like there's a new, um, there's a new finding every week. So it comes back to the theme of choice. We don't really want to be in the position of making choices for people. So there are, there's all kinds of argument about, um, well, should you be eating lots of protein? Should it be mostly a plant-based diet? Try to provide people with options and with information and help them make the choices that work best for them, knowing that there's going to be a lot of variation in, in preference. Um, there are some things I think that are probably pretty well established. Trans fats, not so good. Don't have a lot of those. 
if any, I think. Um, so to the extent that things are well accepted in the literature, that's easy, but it, it does seem to be a, a, an area rife with controversy. Yeah, food, food recalls, that's something I know uh, are the vendors that we work with and the, and the Googlers that we have that are in the kitchens, I'm sure they are on top of this. Um, it, they care deeply about it too. So I don't, I don't have much insight into the mechanics of it. Um, I do know, I've, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a problem with cantaloupe. Um, that stuff was gone. So, and the, and there are, we have a food discuss list. There's an email list for everything internally and they're very active. Uh, Google's a very engaged culture, which is kind of amazing. Um, we have a very, very passionate employee base. When you have a passionate employee base, you don't get to pick what they're passionate about. So it can be cantaloupe, it, it can be your mobile strategy, but it can also be why you pulled this particular snack from the micro kitchen. So the, the food discuss list um, is very active. very active, and there will be all kinds of conversation about whether or not something should be pulled. Thank you, Amy. Next question. Um, you talked uh, mostly about letting people make decisions. Do you guys do any research into like environmental psychology and just more generally how interior design or architecture can be restorative or help focus rather than um, present better choices? Yep. So the, uh, and another, it's another emerging area. So for example, there's the research that shows that walking through, being surrounded by plants or walking in nature is restorative. So how can we design our spaces to en en encompass, to, to include that? We have a, a real estate and workplace services group that focuses on workplace design and they do focus on that. It, it's a difficult place to do research because uh, it's hard to randomly assign people to like you get the great workspace, you get the crappy workspace, and you know then how do you measure the outcome? Uh, so the the we haven't become as involved in it as perhaps we could because the research design is is tricky. But we've we've thought about how how would we design that study? Um, but you're absolutely right. There are there are design issues that um, aren't necessarily about individual choice. Uh, there, I will say though that when it comes to space design, a lot it, it's an interactive space. One of the things I first noticed when I came to Google was um, how much people uh, customized their space and how it, it changed over time. Um, there are whiteboards that people would draw two by twos on and label the axes, and over the course of the week, people would come and fill it in. So one of the first ones I saw was. Shirtless, pantless, duck-like, mouse-like. And then I had Donald and Mickey at the corners. And another one was, fr it was fruit by difficulty and tastiness. So you'd get like pineapple or pomegranates in corners. And people come, and it's this ongoing conversation as people interact with the environment. So it's not this static thing. It's this thing that is a part of your own environment and that you feel consequently a responsibility for as well. Another thing I, I've found quite remarkable is, is this idea that if something's broken, it's not my job to figure out who should fix it, it's my job to fix it, which is a subtle but very different way of reacting to your workplace environment. It's, it's not, somebody left all their dishes in the sink again, I'm gonna call facilities. But like, someone left their dish, I'm gonna move it and put up a sign that says, hey, I'm not your mother, clean up your dishes. So it's this sense of responsibility that permeates um, the, the the workplace and extends to, and not in a punitive way, but in a way that says, oh, I get to, I get to set up a marble roller coaster all around my friend, our cubes here, because we want to, because it's cool. So um, there are many, many instances of, of that, and it makes for a lot of fun. Like the T-Rex that was covered in pink flamingos. There's a T-Rex statue, because of course there's a T-Rex statue at Google. Uh, and somebody put the pink flamingos in its jaw, in its jaw and it was attacked by pink flamingos the next day because it had eaten one, so somebody just came and bought, like somebody went out and bought 40 pink flamingos and covered the T-Rex. On April Fool's Day, somebody else went and got a vending machine because of course the food is free, so they went and got a vending machine and set the prices by fat and sugar content, um, sort of as an April Fool's joke. So it's. But it sets this expectation of I can interact with my environment. So. Awesome. 
a long answer. <laughs> and what was your name? Neil. Neil, thank you. Next question. Do I have a question? Yeah, on Twitter. Oh, I, we have no questions on Twitter yet. Please ask Twitter. Yes. And could you also introduce yourself before asking a question? Yeah. I'm Patricia Bruce, and I'm a doctor in behavioral health. Uh, my question is for availability of food. Uh, if junk food is widely available, why healthy food is not, besides the price? I, I, I understand that it's pricey, but mostly in the problem is when you have availability is one is very available and the other one is very pri pricey. So not in Google, but in an experiment, how can you equal the possibilities of having both? Of, of ha okay, of having healthy options at, at a reasonable price. I am almost certain there is somebody in the room better qualified to answer that question than I, um, as I know it speaks to complicated issues of farm policy and the, you know, economic incentives and all kinds of, uh, of issues. I, it's a question I care about a lot. Um, it's a little beyond the scope of, of what I do professionally. Um, and we, we, we need a change in this country that makes apples as accessible as um, potato chips. And I don't know how we solve that, but um, we need to. The, you, people should have access to good quality, healthy food at a price that's comparable to French fries. Thank you, Patricia. Next question. Twitter people, come on. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, Kyra. So there's the food thing, and then there's the activity level, uh, mm -hmm. Jennifer. And you know, recent evidence is that sitting for certain numbers of days, you know, for every two hours that you sit, your uh, increase of obesity rate, you know, risk goes up 5%. So by the end of, you know, an eight hour day, 10 hour day, you're really w way up there in the numbers. Um, how are you guys designing for that? Or mm -hmm. have, you, have you started to think about those things? Uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, standing desks. You can request them. I had one in, in New York. I have one, again, in Mountain View. Uh, we, there are walking desks you can book. So you can book a 30 minute uh, session on the walking desk. In our Toronto office, the the stairwells are fantastic. They're all really interesting. They're they're painted in such a way so that you want to walk up to find out where they go. They they have these weird maps of of Canada in them. Uh, so it speaks to this question of creating the environment. Um, we encourage walking one on ones. Uh, I I have a colleague who does run on ones with people on her team. So they go running for half an hour and have their meeting while they run. Uh, so things that I think we take for granted, you know, the presence of lockers, the presence of uh, showers, right, that facilitate being able to bike to work, um, which I do on most days. Uh, there are gyms on site, uh, you know, encouraging people to get up and, and walk around having timers available. So it's, it, it is, it's still, you know, a cube farm, right? Um, in many, well, I, don't th I think cube farm might be a stretch in Google's case, but it, the kind of work people do, it, it's sedentary, right? You don't, writing code is not a physical activity. Um, but I think people are becoming increasingly conscious of that. And that I think is part of the key, recognizing that if you're sitting all day, there, you're not gonna be as productive in the near term and, and certainly not in the long term. So how can you help break that up? Can you sit on a bouncy ball? Can you get a standing desk? Can you walk for part of it? So helping people be aware and then suggesting strategies to them that they can take, as well as de designing the environment to be conducive to them. I'm looking at my phone and smiling because we got another question uh -huh. online. I know. <laughs> huh? Maybe, maybe. It works. Uh, maybe I'll do it again. So this is from Healthy Startups. Their question is, could Google now and push notifications be used to drive healthy behavior and habits. Thank you, healthy startups. Uh, almost certainly. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure, in fact, if we could, if this group could probably think of a half dozen ways, different kinds of notifications you could get 
things that, you know, your phone could know that it hasn't moved in an hour. It could say, hey, you, get up. Um, or, you know, when you approach a restaurant, maybe it could sense the, the menu and suggest something to you. So I think there are ways to get technology to help us change our behaviors. I'm also cognizant of the fact that um, technology can be part of the problem. Um, and there are only so many things I want pushed at me on my phone. Um, I, I, I think I might get shot down for saying that. I know I realize I'm from Google. I'm sp not supposed to necessarily be espousing this, but um, we need some moderation. What, what is it? Everything in moderation, including moderation? Mm -hmm. That works for me. Nice. Jefferson? Possibly. No, OK. Andrew has another question. All right, so you brought <laughs> up in the last uh, question before this one, kind of the awareness piece in a little bit here. Um, you know, even though you have all these options available, how can you then start pushing awareness? Like that seems like the next step besides giving options, but uh, making people aware consciously that they're making certain decisions or not. How do you go about solving that problem? Um, it, people need feedback loops, um, especially on, on little behaviors over time. So I think it, Technology may play a good role in that. Uh, you know, what, what, if, what if you could use your phone to scan what you ate and it recognized it, right? It could, you could take a picture of your meal and it could tell you, the, the, give you a rough estimate of the calorie content or the nutritional content. I mean, we've made, who would have thought 10 years ago that you could have reasonable voice technology on your telephone, right? That we'd have things like Siri and Google Voice Ten years ago, I think people thought that was not going to be possible, and, and now it is. So um, are, are there ways we can create feedback loops? And then sometimes it's just providing information, the right piece of information at the right time. I talked about the small plates experiment, letting people know about that research. They're like, oh, I, I had no idea, and they changed their behavior. Are there other instances in one's day-to-day -day life where the right piece of information at the right time helps guide a behavior? Um, either explicitly or implicitly. It could be as simple as you know, putting the apple or the water at the cash register instead of the potato chips. And there has been research that shows, hey, guess what? When you do that, people buy more apples and water and fewer potato chips. So these are simple things, uh, unrelated to, to physical health, but related to financial health. We, we did a study on 401k savings and sent people email sort of, at the, at the end of the, near the end of the year to let them know hey, here's how much you've saved. Google has this match. Um, what if you set a goal? And we tried different manipulations. What if you set a goal? How about changing your contribution to this? Uh, I, I ended up costing the company over a million dollars at the time in, in matching funds that we were not on track to make. We're budgeted for. I, I, I got congratulated, not fired. My <laughs> VP still talks about it as a great example. Um, but one small email got people to save thousands of dollars more that in 20 years is going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars at that one instant. So, so that would be my challenge for, for this group, given what you're all studying, is looking for those points in time and those opportunities to provide that piece of information, to structure the choice, to help people make those decisions that they want to be making, whether it's to walk up the stairs or to choose this the salad, to learn how to make the salad. Um, the recipe for whatever the quinoa black eyed pea salad out yeah. there, that, that was good. Yeah. Like, what, what if we had the recipes available for the food that you thought was good? So th I think there's all kinds of interesting creative ways to do that. Awesome, thank you Andrew. Max. Um, so my question is, as someone who's really interested in this whole topic, is there a starting point you'd recommend, like a certain book, website, podcast, something that would be a good way to start learning about these kinds of things? Read stuff um, outside of the discipline. And I don't say that because I think health-related behavioral uh, literature is in any way poor. I think it's almost certainly fantastic. But I think that the really interesting work happens at the intersection of disciplines. That when you start to apply psychology to economics, and the economists listen for a change, you get behavioral economics. Um, so Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, would be a great place to start. Very accessible. One of the first researchers, one of the founders of behavioral economics, won a Nobel Prize in economics. He's a social psychologist. Uh, so look for 
tangentially related things uh, dis and dis ask yourself, how might this apply in my domain? Um, innovation is in many ways an import-export business. It's taking things that are well known and accepted in one domain, bringing them over to somewhere else where they've never seen it before and figuring out how it applies. So my recommendation would be to go read outside of your discipline, ask other people who are studying different things, have friends who are in uh, other, uh, other schools um, who can tell you, hey, this is, these are the three most interesting articles I've read recently. And if I may add a book, out of MIT, their lab, uh, it's called Social Physics. So it's basically behavior change plus big data. I mean, okay, from the physics perspective. Yeah. yeah. Nudge by um, Thaler and Sunstein is a good one. Mm -hmm. Again, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman is, is a very good one. What about Influence by Cialdini? Yeah. He's, yep, he does good stuff. We can um, just go on and on. Yeah. There, it, once, once you find a couple. You'll uh, get hooked. Yeah, and then you read, the, the key is to find a book with a really good bibliography. Mm. Uh, I remember thinking, initially, when I was first applying to graduate schools, I'd, I, <laughs> I photocopied the journal article, but skipped the bibliography, because I didn't, I was like, I just need the stuff in the article. And mm. I quickly learned, no, 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 no. What you want is the really good bibliography. Nice. Um, so that will, that will lead you down a very happy path. Awesome. Another question. Yay. Among other things, I am one of the co-organizers for Quantified Self Silicon Valley. So I'm wondering how you support uh, Quantified Self, the self-tracking, and which creates awareness through numbers, as well as citizen science at Google. Mm. <laughs> uh, we do in a lot of ways, and I don't know any of the specifics. Um, just a terrible answer. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing my Fitbit right, right here. Uh, I know we have, I know we have efforts. I don't know what they are. I'd be happy to find out and follow up with you, because um, I know there's there's talk of quanti the quantified Googler and and so much. You know, I alluded to earlier the the sense of ownership that permeates the organization, that spills over into projects as well. I mean, there's the much vaunt lauded idea of 20% time at Google where you should get 20% of your time to work on whatever is of interest to you. And that happens. Um, but for me, as again, as, as someone who studies organizations, what I find to be particularly powerful about that is suddenly you have a language for talking about something you're interested in doing that's not part of your core job. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's acceptable within the organization. Because you can say, oh, it's my 20% project. So I'm going to work on a quantified self dashboard even though I'm in sales. Right, or I'm a lawyer, or in whatever, but I'm interested in this, it's my 20% project. So there are people who are very interested, not surprisingly, in data about themselves. We all, we all like to know about ourselves, and when you get people working in the Silicon Valley, they also like data, so data about ourselves is pretty much the sweet spot. Um, so there are, I know there are people working on various initiatives to a greater or lesser degree. So formally within the company, somewhat more informally, generatively, um, things that are very much in process. Um, so it's, it's there, and that's my, I'll stop giving my crummy answer. <laughs> talk later. Thank you. Yes. I have another one. Oh, Max sure. has another question. Great. Um, so I guess, so re last summer I had the opportunity to work as doing behavior design for a video game company. Mm. And so in that particular environment, whenever we made changes aimed at like guiding player behavior, we'd always be confronted with a lot of backlash, just sometimes because people, just because things were different. Yeah. And I was wondering if that ever come up with you. I think you touched on it a little bit, but like, was there ever a time like someone really loved their M&Ms and they were really mad they couldn't find them anymore? Oh anymore? yeah, um, we, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, people don't like change. Um, I, we wanted, so we did a, in one quarter, we did a series of experiments. And one of them was making the building that, that HR that people ops is, it's called people operations, is located in these super healthy uh, buildings. So there were no sugary sodas. It was all healthy. And there was great debate as to, oh, is that healthy? Is that not healthy? But um, the people in our Zurich office got really upset about the fact that Cokes were no longer available in Crittenden 5. Um, so these were people on a different continent um, concerned about something happening in one building out of 40-some um, on the other side of the planet. It, it, somebody even went so far as to say, at first they came for my 
Coca-Cola and I said nothing. And it, it, that person got smacked down really fast. Like, seriously, did you just compare your soda to the Holocaust? Oh, okay, you need to step away from the keyboard. Um, so sure, people don't like change. I think one of the ways that we try to work with it is Google's, we're very transparent with people about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, the level of transparency internally is, is astonishing. So it, with the lab that I run and within people ops, it's one of the cardinal rules. <coughs> Tell people what you're gonna do. Tell them why you're doing it. Let them know if it's working. Like if you say we're gonna pilot this, or we're gonna test this, be clear about what are the criteria by which we're judging success, and then report back. Um, and say, will this work? And be willing to change, right? People are willing to change in the face of data. And one of the questions we asked about the small plates is, if this proved to be successful, um, would you be in favor of eliminating the large plates? Not so much. Um, some people were. But that's the key part, if the data show. So don't just change things. Uh, but explain and prove and then be willing to change back. We, we have Cokes now again in, <laughs> in Crittenden 5. Um, but they are down below on the bottom shelf behind the, behind the frosted glass, so you have to decide you want it, and then there it is. So. Awesome. So there's a question from Mark Harmel from, on Twitter. This question is, how do you impact behaviors where you want them to stop doing something? So again, we don't decide, well, Google might have, you know, HR might have a preference. Like we're not necessarily, we're, well, we provide choice, we're certainly not agnostic. But um, to say when we want somebody to stop doing something means that we're trying to dictate their behavior. So again, this is an issue of how do you guide people into the choices they've said they already want to make, mm -hmm. right? So there is a study out of, um, out of UPenn uh, by uh, Katie Milkman, who looked at how do you get people to work out more. And she found, she combined people's um, guilty, uh, a guilty pleasure with something they didn't want to do. So got people to identify uh, sort of trashy novels that they wanted to read and agree that they would only listen to them on tape in the gym. And in fact, people were willing to pay for a locker for the recording device at the gym to hold themselves to that. So they had to go to the gym, to the pay locker they paid for to get the thing, so that they could listen to the trashy novel while working out. Um, so I guess that's more encouraging people to do something than stop, like you could talk about it, you stop procrastinating about the gym. But again, you try to find ways to um, help people do the things that they say that they wanna do, uh, rather than decide for them. Because I, I will just say, we found again and again within an organizational setting, Right where you're dealing with grown-ups, these are adults. I can tell my toddler no. I cannot tell my colleagues no. You may not. Um, for, my colleagues also won't spit and throw um, <laughs> when I disagree with them usually. So, I, yeah, you, you just have to think very carefully about the environment you're trying to shape and the people who occupy that environment. And remember, these are rational grown-up human beings who have agency and have. Uh, wants and desires and beliefs, and that requires respect. Thank you, Mark Harmel, for asking that question on Twitter. And this is the last question from Tenzin. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you for coming to us and giving us this lecture. Um, I guess my question is, you mentioned, uh, or you spoke about Google's initiative to um, change phys like behavior. Um, and I was wondering if there has been any initiative to change the emotion as well and cultivate emotional awareness and happiness among your employees. Yes, so there are, um, so Search Inside Yourself is, is one program um, that's, in fact, the person who created it wrote a book about it. Uh, there are a number of programs focused on sort of mental, emotional well-being and helping people that, that, one of the challenging things is all of this stuff is hard to measure. Uh, and I don't mean that as an excuse for not studying it, it becomes the big challenge. You know, I, I'm a little jealous of a computer scientists. You know, they get to measure things like milliseconds to search result. Like, I wish I had something so concrete as that. Um, but I deal with people and people are messy and people are complicated. And so, you know, measuring effects on emotional well-being. 
All right, well, I can't put everybody in fMRI, um, uh, and there's only so many surveys you can get people to take. But So we're trying to understand the effectiveness of those programs. And But the short answer is absolutely emotional well-being, emotional health, happiness. These are all part of the greater picture of, of designing for health. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this edition of Stanford Medicine X Live. We'll see you back here on May 13th, 2014 at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time when we'll discuss the topic e-patient leadership, mentoring others, moderated by Nick Dawson with a panel of e-patient leaders. You won't want to miss the next episode of Stanford Medicine X Live. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. From all of us here at Stanford Medicine X, we want to thank you for joining us today and remind you to join us again next Thursday, May 15th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford Medicine X Live featuring a new healthcare design class from the Stanford University School of Medicine called Design for Health. Next week, we are featuring a class on designing for social connection with Azza Raskin from Jawbone and e-patient Emily Kramer Golenkoff. Also, please don't forget that registration for Medicine X 2014 is now open. Don't miss the year's premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Unique opportunities such as our masterclass program and our IDEO design challenge workshop have extremely limited space availability. You'll want to take advantage of these programs while our regular registration pricing is still available until August 1st, 2014. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special thanks to our guest speaker this evening. From all of us at Stanford Medicine X, we'll see you next time.